Welcome and Seek members. Thank you for joining me. My name is Sean O'Connor, and today I'm excited to share with you my thoughts and techniques on challenging the traditional aesthetics of wood-fired ceramics. What's the first thing that pops in your brain when someone says wood-fired ceramics? It might be the layers of ash on the surface, organic patterns dictated by chance and the path of the flame, an earth tone color palette, or it could be the residual marks from the process, like the remnants of seashells we see here at the center of this platter. In the past, using wood as fuel was a necessity because there was no other option like there are today with gas and electric kilns. At the present day, the choice to wood fire is one typically made by personal aesthetics. Here we can see that contemporary artist, Tara Wilson, is making a choice to use the organic surfaces produced by the wood firing to accentuate the organic forms of her zoomorphic shaped base. Artists that use wood firing techniques here in the United States have considered variation on the raw unglazed wood fire surface by experimenting with clay bodies, slips, and kiln design. I have observed though, that the general aesthetic, one of organic flame patterns, complex layers of ash, and marks of the process has not evolved much over the last few centuries. Illustrated here by these two examples, one historic and one contemporary, we can see many similarities regarding the surface. Both forms were fired on their sides, resting on shells, and utilizing the dripping of melting ash to create a sense of movement across the work. In this lecture, I plan to unpack that rich history of wood firing a bit more and ultimately suggest ways in which we, which we can push the boundaries of this historical aesthetic further. In particular, new ways in which we can approach finishing the surface of unglazed wood fired works. I'll start by summarizing a few qualities that are shared in this type of work. I will briefly outline how this particular approach was introduced here in the United States and how it has become the most practiced aesthetic to wood firing. We will compare and contrast some historical wood fire pieces to contemporary works. And lastly, we'll look at some new ways of working with examples of my personal work and a few other contemporary artists working within the wood fire practice. So let's define some of those characteristics that I believe contribute to this particular aesthetic of wood fired ceramics. The first is the organic marks from the flame that is left on the surface as it flows through the kiln during the firing. These marks can be dramatic, like a comet shooting through the night sky with a high velocity flame. Or with a slow flame, marks left behind can be more subtle and quiet, like a steady sunrise, giving us a sense of calmness. These patterns are predictable with experience, but lack specific intention of a mark made directly by the hand. In both cases, these always seem to speak to me of the natural world because of their organic qualities. The second defining characteristic are the complex layers of ash that build up on the surface due to the amount of fuel being burnt. This can range from glossy and wet with heavy ash buildup and high temperatures, or less ash and cooler temperatures will produce a dry matte surface. As most wood fire artists are aware, firing temperature, length of firing, type of wood, and the amount of wood being burnt all affect the color and complexity of the ash buildup on the surface. The third and final defining characteristic of unglazed wood fired surfaces is some of the inevitable shapes left behind from the physical process. Wadding or seashell, seashells are commonly used when firing to temperatures that are high enough to melt ash. They leave a shape on the surface where they have touched the work. Some artists have used the marks left by the wadding as a decorative technique to create compositions of positive and negative space while others capitalize on patterns of contrasting color on the surface. 
We first see these characteristics in the aesthetics of historic works from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. So how did this style from thousands of miles away become the primary one we see here today in the United States? To answer that, I'd like to take us through a quick history of ceramics here in the US relating to wood firing. For thousands of years, Native American potters have used wood to pit fire their earthenware pots. Here, we see a lot of attention given to decoration and detail using slip. Later, settlers brought their wood fire traditions to the Americas in the 1700s. The newly formed colonies supported local potters making salt glazed and alkaline glazed wood fired stonewares and earthenwares. Through the 1800s, local potters were slowly replaced with the industrialization of pottery production. The availability of fossil fuels and economics of manufacturing made wood firing an unpopular and less practical choice at the time. Most people started to prefer this refined, uniform, factory-made china over the uniqueness of hand-thrown pots and the slower involved process behind them. On top of that, later in the 1930s, prohibition and the availability of glass canning chars put most remaining potters out of business. Wheel-thrown pottery became more of an academic and hobbyist pursuit, causing the wood-fired practice to become relatively rare and unknown. But then, in the 1940s, the British potter Bernard Leach published The Potter's Book. Leach's book introduced American craftsmen to the rural Japanese tradition that he studied when living in Japan. In 1950, and again in 1952, Leach traveled throughout the US with Yanagi Suetsu and Shoji Hamada, sharing their pottery making techniques and philosophies. Their visits helped reinforce the rising interest of wheel thrown stoneware vessels here in the United States. This interest sparked American studio potters to start to travel to Japan and study and fire traditional Japanese anagama and naborigama wood-fired kilns. Their experience in Japan firing the ancient kilns and learning about the cultural aesthetics had a profound influence on the American studio pottery movement upon their return. Additionally, two books published in the 1970s introduced many to the specific due to the specific aesthetics and techniques behind unglazed wood-fired ceramics. These books were Daniel Rhodes' Tamba Pottery and Louise Court's Shigaraka, Shigaraki's Potter's Valley. These two books became important sources of information for anyone interested in wood-firing. In December of 1982, the publication Studio Potter ran a special issue on wood-firing. The front cover displayed the glamour of Anagama firing by showcasing ceramic stupor star Peter Volkus's ash crusted plates, which were fired in the firebox of Peter Callis's Anagama. Volkus's high status within the ceramics community gave an extra kick to that rising interest in this aesthetic and style of kiln, helping to bring this technique to the mainstream. It created a demand for more Anagama and Naborigama style kilns here in the US. The first two publicly available kilns were built at Peters Valley Center for Crafts and Aramont School of Arts and Crafts, introducing this technique to an even wider audience. Today, we have a significant number of ceramic artists working with unglazed wood fired surfaces as a preferred method to finish their work. We can clearly see the influence that this East Asian aesthetic has had. Again, you, using those characteristics I identified earlier, the organic flame patterns, layers of ash, and marks of the process. I've always loved this aesthetic because the beauty in the uncontrolled and unknown potential of each piece. But I've noticed that the surface aesthetic of works made today versus historical pieces does not waver significantly. To illustrate this, let's take a look at some historic and present day work and what qualities they share. 
I'll be using examples of utilitarian wear to keep form consistent so that we can solely focus on surface. In these next few slides, I'll be showing examples from recent years of the strictly functional Pottery National Exhibition and historical pieces found at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Although each platter has an individual pattern created by ash and flame, both share dark clay body and wad marks that are emphasized by the contrasting green and yellow color of the ash. It is clear that each artist is using wadding to create a pattern of circles to decorate the face of each platter. The layers of ash on the surface of these two pieces complement the soft organic forms of the vessel. Again, a dark clay body provides a contrast to the layers of yellow ash. The contemporary jar shares aesthetic characteristics of color pattern, sheen, and texture with this historic water jar and could have been made in the same time period. The rawness of surface you see here in these two pieces speak to me of the natural world and the record of time and process. The way both these artists have chosen clays with erupting impurities relates to what we observe with the erosion of weathering rock and soil. Revisiting this comparison, you can see Jack Troy is using organic flame patterns, complex layers of ash, and marks of the process to decorate the exterior of his jar, utilizing a similar approach to the sixth century bottle from Japan. Now I would proudly display either of these works and all the previous examples as, mag as magnificent works of art. <clears throat> this wood firing technique has remained desirable because of the continued richness, complexity, and uniqueness present in each piece. But I'm also questioning what else. Are there new dialogues that we can add to this historic tradition and aesthetic? In recent years, so much research has been done around clay bodies, kiln design, and firing technique, and then shared with the ceramic community around the globe. From what I have researched though, is mainly focused on the subtle nuances within this particular aesthetic. I would like to further all of these techniques in development in order to find my own mark and new approach to surface. Because I believe there are ways of approaching wood firing with a fresh perspective. By reconsidering our approach to process, we can develop tools that expand this aesthetic beyond what it was thousands of years ago. Marks can be reimagined. Here, Simon Levin is using wadding with a high iron content to produce dark marks on the surface. The black circles provide a new interpretation on depth. In this case, these wadding shapes feel more like holes instead of flat dots that are typically left by lighter colored wadding. Color palette is another factor that can be expanded upon we can challenge the stereotypical brown wood-fired surface. Here, Perry Haas is employing an almost pastel color palette by using porcelains that react to the wood in his geographical area and controlling the atmosphere during the firing process. One approach that I've been taking is creating pattern with flame that are controlled and intentional. They have geometric shapes and rely less on the organic and serendipitous marks left by the process of wood firing. I call these flame deflectors, essentially walls of clay with holes, lines, and patterns cut into them, allowing the flame to move through and touch only selected areas of the work. This technique is all about manipulating flame during the firing process in order to create marks or a repeating pattern on the surface that is more controlled. This is a cup with a deflector loaded inside the kiln. To maximize success, I found the deflector had to be placed as close as possible to the corresponding piece and in an area of the kiln with exposure to a high velocity flame. Close to the firebox and on front of a shelf seemed to be the right spot. This technique needs a fast moving flame to push through the openings in the deflector in order to mark the surface with crisper edges. 
This experiment was more successful than I anticipated. The image was recognizable to what I had created within the deflector, and I was impressed that I could transfer an intentional mark to the surface. They are more geometric in nature and start to depart from the traditional organic marks and flame patterns we typically see. I have not been able to produce any imagery with completely crisp detail or complex shapes, leaving specific geometric shapes to work with, lines, squares, circles, and so forth. But this has the potential for a visual vocabulary of intentional marks and has the ability to add new context and meaning to the surface of the work. Because the deflectors needed to shrink with their corresponding pieces for successful transfer of imagery, each deflector could only be used once. To reduce waste of this one-time use object, I explore the possibility of them as objects on their own. For example, this deflector takes on the form of a basket or colander, mimicking the shape of the bowl inside. And here are the two pieces after the firing. What I'm left with is two pieces that exist because of the other. They speak to each other through their shared pattern and journey through the firing process together. The deflector's ability to create intentional marks on the surface led me to start experimenting with small localized saggers to create contained atmospheres on selected areas of the work. Saggers enclose environments that have been used for thousands of years to protect an entire piece from the open flame, smoke, gas, and kiln debris. This protection has allowed for delicate porcelains and glazeware to be produced without the effects of the kiln atmosphere on the surface. Saggers essentially became unnecessary with the advent of cleaner burning gas and electric kilns. But now in the 20th, 20th century, ceramic artists are using saggers for a very different purpose to create unique surfaces on their work at lower temperatures. By adding combustible materials with the work inside the sagger, a new atmosphere is achieved producing variations of color and spontaneous pattern. I admire the dynamic landscape and warm color value that this piece has and really reminds me of wood firing. Instead of placing an entire piece inside the sagger, I wondered what might happen if I only targeted selected areas of the work. For this piece, I created a small sagger which produced a reduction atmosphere on a specific area of the work. What I am left with is a cup that has an unpredictable record of the firing process on one side and the controlled mark of the sagger on the other. Here are two of those cups loaded in the kiln on top of small saggers. The location of the kiln for this technique is much less critical than the location of the flame deflector. And I've been able to have success in many areas of the kiln with this technique. By adding different combustibles like sawdust, charcoal, and colorants in the form of oxides, I've also been able to produce a, very, a variety of colors. In this example, <clears throat> you can see the color purple has been created with the use of cobalt carbonate and an outlying ling of black, black carbon is produced as a sawdust combusts in the sagger. With this technique, I am creating a surface with the qualities that reference traditional wood-fired surfaces, but in a non-traditional and controlled form. For me, the intention behind these marks is moving my work beyond the typical look of the wood-fired process. I've been evolving this technique further by thinking about the shapes of the saggers. Again, trying to make shapes on the surface that move away from the organic patterns typically found. Here, the triangles are used as an attempt to contradict the soft curves and circular form of these two mugs. This is my first attempt at using saggers in the shape of letters. I have plans for the entire alphabet one day. But I've also been thinking about 
other types of language with simplified shapes that could be used to add content to the surface of the work by using either of these techniques of the flame deflector or localized sagger. I'm not really sure I want to take this direction permanently, but it is a path worth exploring. Now let's go back to some of my previous examples of two other artists who are also pushing boundaries in this field. Simon Levin has experimented with wadding shape and placement in non-traditional ways to create decorative pattern on the surface of his work for some time now. The shape and placement of this wadding shows intention and thoughtful decisions by the maker. As we can see, Simon's piece is adding a bold visual pattern that is significantly different than the, than the traditional nuanced surface of Volkus's work. Perry Haas has been developing clays that complement the wood he has access to locally in Montana. Cottonwood, aspen, and mountain ash are all high in, high in potassium and produce larger amounts of ash. Perry developed his clay to allow the high potassium ash to develop texture and unique color on the surface of his work. He is deliberately trying to move away from the stereotypical look we associate with wood firing. Recently, Perry has been doing a lot of post firing work, which I find particularly exciting. He is using resin to mimic and reference ash flow and exaggerate the colors that you can get out of a wood kiln. Perry's post firing technique gives the work an additional expression of a painterly approach. This jar does not inherently scream wood fire, but it speaks with the same visual dialogue, challenging what we typically think of as the wood fire aesthetic. Perry's approach is advancing that conversation with the addition of non ceramic material on a relatively traditional shaped vessel. We cannot, we cannot simply ignore the vast history of the wood firing process. This extraordinary tradition is something that will always inform and inspire how we make work. But ultimately, I believe there is room within this practice to expand the visual vocabulary of surface and push the notion of what we perceive wood firing work to be. Adding intentional marks of content and contemporary resources will diversify the conversation we have with this particular aesthetic. As an artist, I feel it's important to consider diversity in artistic practice and to examine the intention of my own work. This exploration not only helps me push my personal work further, but serves as a model for my students to question, take risks, and challenge their own assumptions. My hope is that by sharing this presentation, others will be inspired to bring contemporary ideas and 21st century resources to the traditional surfaces and processes. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with the community.